Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Football Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined today, as always, by Scott Bogman and Pat Fitzmorris. Fitz will notice I'm wearing my Maryland hoodie because uh, in the middle of recording today's show, Wisconsin and Maryland are going to tip off in the Big Ten tournament. Two teams we are both very optimistic about, he said sarcastically. Uh, I would not recommend uh, anybody watch that game. It's going to be uh, a sight, uh, you know, just really, really ugly. Right, Fitz? Yeah, absolutely, Worm. Um, I don't know if anyone will be able to take advantage of betting against Maryland in either, uh, well, in the NIT, if they're able to make yeah. that. I don't know if they're positioned for that. But uh, I would recommend betting against Wisconsin in the first <laughs> round of the NCAA tournament. The, the, the word is that Maryland would actually decline an NIT invite because all of their good seniors are just done with the season. The vibes are bad. They're out. Like, wouldn't even wow. participate so they couldn't field a team. It's been that kind of a year in College Park for hoops. That, of course, is not what everybody is listening for. So we will jump into the actual show, which is, as always, a loaded one. We are reacting to free agency from a dynasty perspective. I just want to let everybody know all of our early 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. From there, you can also navigate to our staff dynasty rankings on the site. I want to also let everybody know that tomorrow, and we're recording this Thursday, so Friday, March 15th, this week, there's going to be more Dynasty talk over on Discord with Fitz and Bogman hosting a live stages. That's Friday, March 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern. You can check that out at fantasypros.com slash stages. Go check out Discord anyway, even if you can't make that time, because they will always be on there answering questions in their channels. Everybody's there to help you out and talk fantasy, but specifically for a live stages, again, Friday, 5 p.m. Eastern this week. Also, one more thing to note, tomorrow... I will be taping a free agency winners and losers from a redraft perspective with Debro and Erickson. So if you're looking for the non-dynasty, just kind of general winners and losers of this early time in the offseason as well, you can find that too. We've got tons of free agency content coming your way, so be sure to stick with us for all of that. Guys, let's dive right in. I mean, it's you know, free agency impact in Dynasty, the the you know scope of the, of the episode is pretty clear. I want to start with the running backs. Usually we start with quarterback just because it's such an important position. But those first two days, especially of the legal tampering period, it was really like the running back show. We talked a bit going into free agency about how because the rookie class isn't so good, maybe there might be more interest in these veteran guys. That was clearly how it played out. So, Bogman, before we get into anybody specific, what was your takeaway just from all the running back shuffling around in those first couple of days? Yeah, a little bit of it was surprising, but a lot of it was, uh, you know, very need based. So uh, we talked about this with Erickson on the flagship. Right. And uh, Erickson and I got Austin Eckler. Right. I don't know if we got anybody else. Right. He might have got uh, I think he might have had Pollard to Tennessee. I, I wanted him going back to Dallas. But um, yeah, a lot of big moves here. A lot of fun moves, uh, exciting ones. And, and I'm happy to see. Uh, the first guy here move on to a better situation first so Fitz can quit hating on him. <laughs> yeah, we'll jump right in. I think this is actually one Erickson called as well, and it's Saquon to the Eagles. Obviously, Saquon comes with a ton of pedigree. He's such an exciting player, was not in the best situation in New York. <laughs> Fitz, Bogman just kind of set you up here. Are you going to hate Saquon less now that he's in Philly? <laughs> Uh, I will probably hate him less. And yes, like <laughs> one of my big hangups with Saquon is that he has not been all that dynamic in the passing game since about 2019, which is a long time ago. Um, and I, I don't know that this is going to be that much better for him as a pass catcher. The Eagles had the 12th fewest running back targets last year, just 93. Um, and, you know, you have to be a little bit concerned about Saquon potentially use, losing short yardage touchdowns with the tush push. But much healthier ecosystem and i think you have to be pleased with that if you're a saquon stakeholder um it goes from maybe one of the well not even maybe one of the worst offensive lines in the league to one that yes the the eagles just lost jason kelsey to retirement but they still have jordan mylotta um lane johnson landon dickerson the like, highest is, paid guard in the league now landon dickerson yeah, yeah exactly so this is a really good offensive line and i i think it can only help saquon so um i'm excited I moved him up in my dynasty rankings. I've got him RB10 now, even though he's age 27 and, you know, might not have that long to go before he hits the age cliff. 
Bogman, do you think that the overall touchdown opportunity is going up or down? Because obviously everybody's talked about the fact that because of the tush push, it you know kind of robs these Philly running backs of those short goal line opportunities. But there's just more touchdowns to be scored in general in Philly than there were in New York. So do you think overall in the aggregate this is better <laughs> specifically for his touchdowns or worse? There's a possibility the tush push is done, guys. I mean, Kelsey yeah. was the main 100%. hog of that piece, so maybe that is done. Plus, you're gonna have to pay. Uh, you're gonna have to pay Hertz a lot of money. Do you want your quarterback uh, putting himself in those piles for the majority of his career? It was fine for two years. Do we want to keep doing it? Like I know, I know Hertz is never gonna back off. He's he's gonna want to do it. But you just paid Saquon. Let him take the brunt of that uh, at the end. He's way bigger. So, um, you know. Hertz had the finger injury in, in one of the piles last year, too. So uh, let's let's give that ball to our big boy in the backfield. Let's give it to Saquon and let him score all those touchdowns. So I'm I'm excited about it. I think there's going to be way more opportunity, even if the tush push is still around, because the Eagles have a competent offense and the Giants have not had a competent offense for a long time. Would you have Saquon hot? He's ECR in Dynasty. He's nine. Fitz just mentioned he has him 10. Where do you have him? I have him at nine. I don't know if I can move him up because I have guys that are way younger than him and Walker and Kyron right above him, but he's definitely not moving down anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think overall, definitely, you know, I'm with you guys. An exciting move for sure. A surprising move on day one, Josh Jacobs to the Packers. Fitz, as the Packers fan, I'm curious what you think just, you know, from being a Green Bay fan, but also, of course, in the dynasty perspective, this was a move that I don't think many people saw coming. Yeah, I didn't see it coming either, Worm, to be totally honest with you. I thought maybe they were going to retain Aaron Jones and, and just draft another back, and that wasn't the case. Um, we know that maybe they wanted to get a little younger at the position. Um, it, it's interesting because Jacob's numbers last season were the worst of his career. Not only the, the surface stats like yards per carry, where he averaged 3.5, but also things like yards per contact um, per carry – not good. And um, PFF and some of the other sites that are looking to quantify offensive line performance would tell you that the Raiders and the Packers weren't that far apart in terms of their offensive line play last year. I mean, I, I think the Packers line is better. But um, I don't know, just watching Josh Jacobs last year, there was really nothing with the eye test that made me think he had tumbled over the cliff or, or, you know, had gotten demonstrably worse. I don't know how you guys feel about that. So I don't know. I'm optimistic. I, like, I've always thought that Jacobs is one of the toughest, hardest nose runners in football, and he can catch passes. So I think he's going to fit what the Packers want to <laughs> do. Feels like a good opportunity also, right? I mean, just the, this is a young, ascending offense. I know Jordan Love threw a lot in the red zone last year, which is part of how he had a lot of fantasy value. But if you have a guy like Jacobs who's done it before, you would think that he would be considered a pretty strong option down there as well. Bogman, again, you know, this is, you know, ECR 13, just outside RB1 territory. In Dynasty, where do you think you have him? Yeah, I have him at, <clears throat> excuse me, I have him at 12. I could move him up a couple spots here uh, as well, maybe 210, like right underneath Barkley. And um, I think the thing that you saw that was different in Vegas last year for Josh Jacobs was just terrible quarterback play, right? I mean, um, there is, Derek Carr, I wouldn't say is great, but he is serviceable. And we did not have a serviceable quarterback in Vegas last year between Aiden O'Connell and Jimmy G. So, I think knowing that, knowing they had stacked boxes, um, I think that hurt Josh Jacobs. Plus, he was coming off, you know, a season where he led the league in touches and yards. So um, I think that uh, I think this is a much better situation for him. And he becomes the wily vet of this team at 26 years old. You know what I mean? Because they're so young um, and we know they can pass. And I think Josh Jacobs is the best parts of Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon put into one guy. So. I think he's going to be a monster. I think he's going to be a lead back. I think this year in particular is going to be huge for him. And moving forward, I think he's going to be pretty solid there as well. They still need depth, but uh, Jacobs is going to be the main cog. So given this landing spot, is he somebody you're looking to maybe buy low on coming off of last year? Absolutely. Yeah, if you can buy low on Josh Jacobs, I absolutely would. Let's go to the guy that he's replacing in Green Bay, Aaron Jones, moving within the division to the Vikings, coming off of you know his worst season for fantasy since his rookie year. 
obviously getting older can still do some things and, and help the team but um you know clearly isn't the same guy he was when he was you know an elite fantasy asset so Fitz I'll start with you again from the dynasty perspective aging running back changing teams usually not a great formula yeah I mean really good player but Aaron Jones is 29 and he's going to a team that um, there has to be some question about the potency of the offense with the quarterback situation. And this is coming from someone who still is holding out a little bit of hope for Sam Darnold, uh, <laughs> like proving himself starting caliber once again. What are you, but, the NFL, Fitz? I mean, yeah. everybody likes Sam yeah. Darnold. Every team's going to give him a shot. But um, so Aaron Jones did close the regular season with three consecutive 100 yard rushing days, then tacked on two more in the playoffs, including that three touchdown performance against Dallas. Good player, really good player. But age is a concern. The supporting cast and the change of scenery might not be an upgrade uh, in you'd be hard pressed to call it an upgrade for sure. So I've got him RB 32 in dynasty. I don't know if that jives with uh, you Boggs and ECR. I got him at 31. So uh, yeah, I think he's up at 26 in ECR for the record, Uh, a little bit higher there. You know, Fitz and I, I've added the rookies. So um, that, that is where he is with rookies before the draft. You know, obviously that's kind of a crapshoot, but um Look, I, Aaron Jones proved it at the end of last season. That there's still juice in there. It's probably just not as much as there has been. And this is a team in the Vikings that when you lose a guy like Kirk Cousins, you go to Sam Darnold or, you know, even if they draft what Th- our boy Thor wants and J.J. McCarthy, they are going to run the football more. They have to, right? Um, so I know O'Connell is a pass-heavy guy, but Aaron Jones is going to get the football. I mean, I re- this really hurts my feelings for my guy Ty Chandler. I, I thought, uh, you know, they, they're so quick to abandon the run in Minnesota. At least they were last season. We'll see what they do this year with Darnold or whoever. Uh, but I do think they are going to have to run the ball way more this year. And that's good for Aaron Jones and maybe uh, good for Ty Chandler as a change of pace guy, too. Worth noting on Jones, too, and, and this might be a knock against him given the age, but he, what, there, he was dealing with injuries last year. It was his first time mm-hmm. since 2018 that he played under 14 games in a season. He played 11 last year, so that obviously led into the overall ranking being lower. And, and to your guys' point, he certainly finished really strong from a from a yardage standpoint, even if he wasn't getting the end zone at the end of the regular season. Uh, one person who I expect to get in the end zone quite a bit next year is the next guy. That's Derrick Henry in Baltimore. It was the match made in heaven. Literally everybody going into this free agency period said, you know what I'd really like to see is Derrick Henry lining up in the backfield with Not Lamar Jackson. Warm. I shouldn't say everybody. Everybody except for fans in, of AFC North teams, including Scott Bogman. But uh, this was just like the fun, obvious pairing. I'm really glad it happened. From a Ravens fan perspective, I'm glad that they didn't have to go, you know, as as deeply invested financially as some of the other running backs went. You know, Saquon and Jacobs got really pretty reasonable deals, especially considering what the state of the position has been in free agency in recent years. Derrick Henry, two years, $16 million. It's like a one-year, $9 million guaranteed, and then hopefully he's good enough that you get another year. Uh, what a fit, though. I mean, I know he's 30. This is a dynasty show, so you can't get too over your skis with a, with a running back that age. I just pointed out how a running back changing teams whose aging is not a good formula, but boy, is it just exciting to think about Lamar Henry when Keaton Mitchell is back. Those three in the backfield together – is uh, is going to be a sight to behold. Bogman, I'll start with you as a Steelers fan, but also more importantly as a dynasty manager. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, look, I have him at 19. So, uh, and I had that before he was in Baltimore. And there's a couple guys I might move him ahead of. It really, I I don't want to because of the years. You know, he's six years older than Javante. He's six years old, or uh, four years older than Najee and. Um, three years older than Tony Pollard. So it's hard to put him ahead of those guys who probably still have maybe a little more gas left in the tank. But we've talked about Derrick Henry before. He is a freak of nature. This Derrick Henry is still one of the best backs as he's slowing down. Um, he was the best back by so much that it's just hard to... Um, it's hard to slow this guy down, and it's a perfect fit in Baltimore. We know he's going to be uh, getting a lot of carries from Lamar. It makes Lamar more dangerous because everybody's going to be keying in on Derrick Henry, too. So it just helps this offense a lot, and I'm really glad they spent the money on him so the Steelers can snap up Patrick Queen. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think it worked out for everybody, Worm. Let's say that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was not. I, I expected to lose Queen. I was not expecting mm-hmm. to lose into Pittsburgh. So that was uh, an unfortunate downer. But I mean, Derrick Henry was RB eight in half PPR last year, even with his like taking a big step back. Clearly, from what he had been. To your point, that's how good he was prior to last season. Uh, he scored fourteen touchdowns last year. Are you telling mm-hmm. me he can't take all of Gus Edwards' yeah. touchdowns and more next year? I mean, this is a a rushing attack that, that is was just with will levis next to him for most of the season and now yes. he's got the mvp next to him. now he's got so, the mvp yes. and a team that Ugh. wants to run in near the goal line and doesn't want to run with lamar near the goal line they prefer to just smash it back into the line and let him fall into the end zone and that's what they have in derrick henry i mean fitz I, again it's he is 30 so it, it's fun to get hyped because of the name and because of the excitement of seeing what this backfield is going to look like next year but it, there is reason to throw some cold water on this yeah, and um, as the dynasty ageist on this show, I'm happy to be the guy uh, getting out the pail of cold water. So I've, I've got Henry RB31 in dynasty, but I will say that, um, look, even though I'm not going to be taking him in any dynasty startup drafts because of the way I like to build, if you are in win now mode and Derrick Henry is on the roster of a team that's really not in win now mode, you should be kicking the tires on him and, and maybe throwing out some offers. And if you have Derrick Henry on your roster and you're not in win now mode, you should definitely be looking to deal him because, I mean, this I I think this is going to perk up enthusiasm for Derrick Henry. I I do think, like, I know this is a dynasty show, but in redraft, I think I'm going to be really aggressive about getting him next year because I just don't see any way, given the way this offense operates and how good we expect it to be, assuming health, I don't see any way he scores less than, like, like absolute floor is, like, 12 touchdowns. And I think very likely more like 15. Again, in this offense, the way they want to run it, what we just saw from Gus last year, who I love, but is not Derrick Henry, like... The the rush the touchdown equity alone I think is going to make him an RB one next year and I don't think he's going to be drafted that highly just because I think people will be afraid of the age I mean do you, again I know this is a dynasty show but in redraft Bogman do you think that's crazy uh, no not at all I mean I'm gonna have him I'm gonna have him absurdly high in redraft and yeah. um you know. I don't want to take him because I don't want to have to root for your rap birds all year, but uh, I'm probably going to be high on him and he's probably going to be a guy that I get a lot. So I will probably be rooting for Derrick Henry uh, right along with you this year a lot, uh, Worm, so we can I you can win wait. and I can win some money. I cannot so. wait to message you about him every time he scores mm, a touchdown, man. especially against the Steelers. Uh, I want to bring up the guy who's replacing him who's actually ranked much higher in Dynasty that, at least. Henry is RB25 in Dynasty in consensus. Tony Pollard is RB18. A bit of a surprise here. I, I did not expect to see him in, in Tennessee, certainly. Um, I thought there were a few other options that made more sense for Pollard. But, you know, coming off, you know, relative to expectations, certainly a disappointing season, but one where he seemed to get healthier as it went on. The Titans we've seen under previous regimes are certainly willing to give a ton of work to their running backs. It's now a different coaching staff, so we'll see how that plays out here. But Fitz, I'll start with you. Tony Pollard to the Titans. What was your reaction to that? And do you think RB18 is too high, too low, just right in Dynasty? I think everyone was expecting the Titans to bring in someone to pair with Ty J Spears and and not count on Ty J Spears to be like a, a workhorse back, um, especially since Ty J Spears has no ACL in one of his knees and we don't know what the durability is going to be for him. But I didn't realize they were going to make this sort of an investment. They did have money to throw around. They were in really good salary cap shape. Um, So I don't know. I think Pollard goes back to being the sort of timeshare back he was earlier in his Dallas career. And maybe that's a good thing because the efficiency didn't really travel into a beefier role for him last year. So hopefully he owns the passing downs again, although Ty J. Spears was actually pretty good on passing downs. I don't know quite what that's going to look like for the Titans this year. Um, And and the other thing is health. Like hopefully we get improved health because Pollard said he wasn't fully healthy last year until the Dallas Carolina game, which I believe was week 11. So, um, you know, he had that injury at the end of the 2022 season. I think it was against the 49ers in the playoffs, a hip drop tackle, bad high ankle sprain, fractured lower leg, had to have tightrope surgery, which is kind of a big deal. I'm optimistic. I've got him RB22. I know that's below his ECR, but, you know, that includes rookies and... um, I don't know. I'm, I suspect some rankers are going to downgrade him slightly because of the landing spots. So all in all, like not 
horrified by where he's going, even though their offensive line was bad. Um, I don't know. It could be an offense on the rise. There's a lot riding on Will Levis's shoulders this year, though. Yeah, definitely. Bogman, what do you make of Pollard in Tennessee? You know, I, I look at uh, the new coaching staff here, Callahan, and I think of what Joe Mixon was to Cincinnati for a little bit. I think Pollard has that type of a ceiling, right, of one of the better backs in the NFL if they give him that workload. But there's so many ifs here in this situation, right? If uh, Will Levis works out, if the offensive lineman uh, can be an improved group this year because they were awful last year and Derrick Henry was good behind a bad line last year too which is kind of crazy to think of but they you know they brought in Calvin Ridley they still have DeAndre Hopkins and with the new staff hopefully upgrading this offensive line too um, you know I, I'm I'm positive on, on him and I just I haven't moved Tony Pollard at all I have him in this kind of tier with um, you know Pacheco Najee Stevenson Javante so you know, wherever you want to put him in that group, in my opinion, is fine. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bury him like our guy Fitz over there. I'm not gonna bury <laughs> Tony Pollard quite yet. So, uh, not done, not done with Tony Pollard quite yet. The landing spot, I'm lukewarm on, but I'm not really moving him. How uh, how are well, you guys? How are you guys feeling about Ty J for Dynasty now? That hurts. I mean, for me, I I think I think it just really hurts because, you know, Tony Pollard is a main back and you paid him. You know, when you pay a running back, you're usually going to use them uh, pretty heavily. So I think for the first year or two here, it's going to be heavy Pollard. Taisha will be the B back, the change of pace or whatever. In my opinion, I don't think he's going to even be like a third down back. I think he's just going to be a change of pace guy, which sucks. Um, And, you know. Obviously, he has, like you said, fits the knee injury already, missing the ACL. So I really don't like it for Taishay. I don't. I don't think it's tilted more than like sixty forty though toward Pollard. And even that, I I would be maybe even surprised if Pollard got as many as. But he's going to get like all 60. of the goal line stuff. I think. So. But he, he just struggled so much with that last year that I, I I'm right. really curious. I, I I don't feel like I have a good sense of what this backfield will look like because to Boggs's point they just spent a lot of money on Pollard you don't do that unless you plan to use him but to Fitz's point like like again we saw last year that he was worse without a Zeke Elliott to share the backfield with so I mean I he will get the favorable end of the committee I would assume given you know the money and investment and everything but I I think it might be more of a committee that that's that's my thing is they're very similar Right. Yeah. So I think if you were super confident in Taije, you wouldn't bring a guy yeah. that is, you know, uh, that is very similar to him, but maybe just a better version. So that that's my concern about Taije. I think that's a good point. Where do you guys have Spears in your dynasty rankings? Um, he, he, I had he's up him... at RB 21 in in ECR. I think that probably just hasn't been fully updated yet to reflect, uh, you know, the, the, the Pollard edition. But right now he's pretty highly ranked. I got him at 33. I think I'm 31. Okay. All right. uh, one other player who I think is also aging, but that also might be a part-time player, is Austin Eckler to the Commanders, uh, a guy who in the past has specifically asked his coaching staff for fewer carries, um, but obviously has been you know historically efficient, very good in the passing game. Uh, you know, Going to the Commanders, this was another match that I think a lot of people saw coming, given the Anthony Lynn connection. Now, Bogman, I'll start with you here. Austin Eckler, he's RB29 in ECR. Is that too high, too low, or just right? I think it's probably a little too high. I think, like you said, this is a guy moving more in the direction uh, of becoming a different type of player, right? So, um, and Brian Robinson, I still think, is a better back than him. Um, Maybe not. Uh, Maybe Brian Robinson isn't. Uh, Maybe they don't like Brian Robinson. I'm not sure. Obviously, his new coaching staff, it's Cliff Kingsbury. You worry about carries, but also... I don't think you really need to worry about carries because two times the Cardinals with Cliff Kingsbury calling plays were below average. They were both 19th. That's the bottom 22 and 19, but they were six and seventh in carries uh, per game rush attempts per game. I should say um, uh, in, in the sandwich years there. And I think, we forget how up tempo this offense is. There's going to be plays for Robinson and Austin Eckler. So very, very up tempo offense, um, pass heavy for sure. And Austin Eckler fits better there, but I still think Brian Robinson is a better back. He's younger as well. So I think Eckler is moving into more of a third down role. 
Um, and, and like you said, he's wanted to have carries taken off. I think that's something he definitely discussed with Anthony Lynn before. So look, if he has a hot hand, they'll, they'll ride him. They'll give him carries if he's having a good stretch. But I think for the most part, he's a B to Brian Robinson. So I'm really not, I, the landing spot is fine, but I think we need to take what Eckler is going to do with a grain of salt because I think he's a different back at this point in his career. Fitz, what do you make of Eckler in the nation's capital? If you play in a dynasty league with me and you are consuming this show, I ask that you not make me any trade offers involving Austin Eckler because I will be <laughs> batting them down like King Kong batted down biplanes from atop the Empire State Building. <laughs> Once the milk goes bad, I do not want to consume it, even if it's poured over some deliciously sugary cereal like Cinnamon Toast Crunch or Peanut Butter <laughs> Captain Crunch. Just avoid that with Eckler. I have no interest in a 29-year-old Austin Eckler who is completely ineffective in 2023. Fitz is carrying over some of the cereal discussion we had uh, mm. in a recent uh, you know, team <laughs> meeting getting together uh it, cinnamon toast crunch was uh is is one of my favorites were well. apple so jacks I, brought I up i mean it. apple jacks probably my number one so i'm not really you know, an apple jack they still guy. make those <laughs> oh my god so so I'm i was not, not i was not allowed either. to have sugar cereal in the house growing up um oh. my mom who is visiting so uh, same in case she can hear me i love you very much but she um <laughs> she would not allow sugar cereal so uh honey bunches of oats and frosted mini wheats were like the most unhealthy we were allowed to have Ooh. everything else had to be healthier so i never had like the reese's puffs or the cinnamon toast crunch or cocoa puffs or any of the that you know lucky charms honey bunches of oats underrated yeah, yeah I, I think it's great Solid. i mean i i yeah. Big fit. Also, those two mix together really well, but uh, mm -hmm. that's enough cereal talk. Let's go to DeAndre Swift to the Bears. One of the first deals we saw on that day one of the tampering period. Um, a little bit of a surprise. This is a backfield that had pieces that people have been interested in over the last couple of years. I was happy to get Roshan Johnson in a lot of you know second rounds of, of dynasty rookie drafts just a year ago. Um, doesn't look as good now, and that they've you know given money, to, real money, to Swift. Uh, but Bogman, I'll start with you again here. Swift to the Bears. What do you make of that? I hate it. I do not like this landing spot at all for DeAndre Swift. I think he was in the perfect situation for himself uh, in Philly. Uh, it worked out real well behind one of those great offensive lines. And like we said, um, everything else poured together, more opportunities for him and all that stuff. It is the opposite in Chicago. Unless Caleb Williams comes in here and is Patrick Mahomes, there's just not a lot of room for a smaller back. I think bigger backs fit better uh, for this offense right now, like Roshan. Um, Herbert is ki kind of does the same stuff that Swift does, in my opinion, uh, maybe not as well. Uh, so I was just surprised to see Swift get so much money. I think this is going to be a similar situation to what he had in Detroit, and I just really do not like the landing spot. I am not. I wasn't high on Swift going in because he was a free agent, and I did not think Philly was going to bring him back, and they ended up not bringing him back. So I just really don't like the landing spot for Swift. Um, you know, if somebody else would have landed there, I think if Josh Jacobs had been in Chicago, it would have been like, okay, here we go. Here's a main back. But I think he's going to be a piece of this backfield, and I don't like that. So um, I'm probably going to be passing on Swift uh, everywhere. Fitz, where are you at on Swift? Man, I think he's one of the hardest guys to value in Dynasty, or redraft for that matter. I mean, Detroit rejected him after, after several seasons. The Eagles saw what he offered and said thanks but no thanks then chicago turns around and gives him a pretty decent contract but you have to wonder if he is going to clearly just relegate roshan johnson and khalil herbert to the dustbin or if it's going to be like a committee um i mean this has to be a downgrade for roshan right like there there was yeah. really and and there was very little evidence last year that he could be capable of carrying an NFL backfield. So I understand why they wanted to add something, but boy, this is going to be murky. How would you how would you uh rank the three guys, you know, Roshan Herbert and and Swift in Dynasty? Fifth. I mean, mm. Swift Swift is still top 20 for me. Like he catches passes. Boy, based on week two and week three last year, he looked like a world beater for Philly. And then after that, I don't think he had another 100-yard game after having, what, like 300 combined rushing yards in those two games. So he he's still top 20 for me. That might be too high, but that's just where I end up with him. Um, 
And I, I'd rather have Roshan in Dynasty than Herbert. Just He's got the youth, and I think he's got a versatile sk- skill set, so he could p- conceivably play on any of the three downs. I, I just Herbert's another guy I have no idea what to do with anymore. Like, looks good whenever he plays, but no one seems to want to give him a, a significant role. Do you see that backfield similarly, Bogman? Yeah, I think Pitt, uh, Fitz described it perfectly with, uh, you know, murky. I think that's the right word. I have Swift at 29. I don't like him. Uh, I don't, you know, he had scored six touchdowns with Philly last year. So, you know, if you score six with Philly, how many, or I know, I know Hertz had a lot, but how many are you scoring with Chicago? I don't know. I just, um, I really don't like the spot. Uh, I think, uh, like Fitz said, Herbert has to be the odd man out here because Swift and Herbert do similar things, right? Roshan is your bigger hulking back that's really good on pass downs, too, in terms of blocking. So I think it's going to be Roshan and Swift. I don't know what the split is going to be, but I think, you know, like we said with Pollard, when you pay a guy like Swift, I think he, at least initially, gets the bulk of the carry. So, you know, a 70 30. 65 35 split something like that uh in swift's favor and i just i don't know i don't think he can do it so i'm not a big fan fits antonio gibson to the patriots what do we make of that one boy uh i'm the original antonio gibson truther but it's hard to find the silver lining in this uh, signing because it, it just feels like a lateral move. He goes from one mediocre offense to another. Now he's behind Ramondre instead of Brian Robinson, and I think Ramondre is better than Brian Robinson, so hard to see Gibson getting significantly more touches out of this. About the only positive is that the New England coaching staff probably isn't going to bench Gibson every time he fumbles. Uh, just you know, lock him away in fumble jail and throw away the key like Ron Rivera did every time, so Still, though, I, I've got him like RB58 for Dynasty. I just don't see much reason for optimism. He's 46 in ECR, RB46. Antonio Gibson, Bogman, what do you think? Yeah, I have him at 51. And um, I, I, I tell you what, I, I think I can find a silver lining here. If Alex Van Pelt wants to put him out in the slot maybe a little bit more right because this is a guy that played wide receiver at memphis he came into washington they moved him to running back they don't have any speed on this team still so you know maybe this is an option in the slot on occasion but stevenson's going to be the main guy you know i don't even know if gibson uh, when it's all said and done after rookies are drafted i don't even know if i have him as an rb4 so probably an rb5 um lateral move with the offense not being good and you know we don't know who the quarterback is right now we can probably go quickly on this one but Devin Singletary to the Giants what do we think about that I mean obviously a significant amount of carries are opening up with Saquon not there um, but Singletary hasn't really been able to take advantage of that so much in the past Fitz what do you think about him not super excited long term but in the short term I actually think it's good for him in terms of playing time even if it's not the healthiest offensive ecosystem yeah same uh, you know, uh, a good spot in terms of he's going to get a lot of touches, but not a very good offense. So you got to hope if you're rostering Singletary that, uh, you know, Daniel Jones looks like the best version of himself and they add some talent uh, at wideout. This next one I'm really intrigued by. Actually, Zach Moss to the Bengals. Obviously, Joe Mixon is gone. We'll get to that in a second. But Moss, when Jonathan Taylor was not playing last year in Indy, had some really nice performances. I had him in a dynasty league where I wanted to lose. I was trying to rebuild, and he kept winning me games on accident because he just kept <laughs> playing, you know, above what I thought he was he was really capable of. But he, when he had that backfield to himself, he was getting the workload. He was doing the passing game. He was doing it everywhere. I was really impressed. There could be an opportunity here. I know Chase Brown obviously is somebody that there was, you know, we've had some some degree of interest in in the past, but Zach Moss and Cincy Bogman, I kind of like it. I like Zach Moss. I think Zach Moss is a very good running back. The problem with Zach Moss is that he has missed games in every single season that he's played. And it's not just the missing games. It's also the questionable tag, the doubtful tag, the if he plays, how much are they going to give him uh, stuff? So that is, you know, Zach Moss is a highly skilled running back that cannot stay on the field. I think he's probably better than Chase Brown in terms of just uh, being a runner. But 
Chase Brown availability is the best ability, and that dude has it. He had all kinds of carries at Illinois and looked great, and now he's got an opportunity in a very good offense in Cincinnati to possibly uh, take a much bigger workload than he had last year with Joe Mixon there. So uh, I like the opportunity for both these guys. I think Moss is better, but I think this is going to be closer to 50-50 than anticipated. What, what do you make of this backfield, Fitz? I, to me, Moss is the type of guy who are, I'm maybe not necessarily going out and making a bunch of offers for him right now. I'm probably not looking to sell him either he just feels like the type of player where if you had him already you're about to kind of reap some of those rewards um, with the added value but it's not like he's going to be like a league winner or anything like that yeah I that's a good way to put it worm like I I think the Derrick Henry signing is going to spawn a lot of trades because he should be on win now teams whereas the Zach Moss signing I think is just like the stakeholders want to keep him and no one's really rushing out to go and trade for him either so I agree with that. We were probably expecting him to sign as a backup somewhere, and this is better than you could have expected from Moss, going to a really good offense where he's going to play. And um, I'm, I'm really excited for Chase Brown now. Like, I've got Chase, I've got Moss RB50 in Dynasty and Chase Brown RB26. And what we saw to Brown last year was really exciting, even if it was in a pretty limited dose. But we're going to get a heavier dose now this year in that really good offense. And, and what I'd like this to look like is an Ezekiel Elliott, Tony Pollard type split, where Moss is playing the Zeke role, albeit, you know, He's a pretty watered down version of uh, peak Zeke <laughs> Elliott and uh, Chase Brown in the Pollard role. Like, I, I think that is how this could work out really well if, you know, if Moss can hold up because Bogman mentioned the injury concerns. Do, am I forgetting? Do they have any kind of name as RB three? I feel like this could be a team. Travion given Williams. That, Travion. Okay, Williams. Yeah, right. Chris that, Evans. That guy's never. Still there. Yeah, those guys have never teamer. been able to get traction. Uh, I bring that up to say I wouldn't be surprised if this is a team that maybe drafts like a you know day three running back as sure. well to pair with those two since neither of them really is fully proven or anything yet. And this is again we, we've talked about it a lot. It's maybe not the best running back rookie class, but there are, there are role players available, so I could see them maybe trying to get kind of a third name into the mix as well. The guy that's leaving Cincy uh, and is traded to the Texans, Joe Mixon, uh, somebody who has been a really really valuable fantasy asset in the past and is now in just a sublime landing spot. But I was talking with Erickson, uh, you know, a couple of days ago when this trade first happened that, you know, to what degree do we think Mixon is, is actually kind of washed? I know he had a bit of a bounce back last year. Again, the landing spot is really great. I'm not that excited about the player at this stage in his career. I might be a little overly negative though. What do you think Fitz? Uh, you frame that really well. Also worm like, I, man, I, I didn't, no, I, I wasn't very enthusiastic about Mixon with the Bengals because there were always the rumors that they were going to release him and, you know, eventually that happened. But um, th this is just a, a good landing spot for him because at least we have clarity with Joe Mixon now. And I agree he's, you know, not one of the 10 most talented backs in the league, even though he's been really productive. Um, a good rental for, for dynasty managers in win now mode just like Derrick Henry and I don't know I mean I'd say his value is equivalent to an early second round pick in super flex drafts like I I think if I were in win now mode I'd be willing to give up um that sort of a pick or or maybe like 108 or 109 in a one QB dynasty league because like what? he's going to be able to help you this is a great offense he's going to carry the load mostly by himself I think Damian Pierce is just a strict backup so there's absolute 2024 value for him maybe beyond so um you know even though I I'm not you know, projecting let, a lot of me, value into like his third year <laughs> with the Texans. Uh, Can I ask you a, a player debate here? Uh, sure. Would you rather have Joe Mixon or um, let's go with Nick Chubb? Mixon. About uh, Mixon or Zach Charbonnet? <sighs> that one's tough, right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I... I got him next to each other. That's why I asked you. I Solve think this I, problem for me, Fitz. <laughs> well, I had Mixon behind Charbonnet, and then upon this signing, I moved Mixon ahead of Charbonnet. I have him two spots ahead of Charbonnet. So, and uh, it's difficult though because you know, for me, I do look even in Dynasty. I look in a shorter window. I look for three years, right? 
but I think Mixon is one of these guys that you have to look at year to year moving forward. Yeah, because agreed. if he does not produce for Houston, they will cut him. And who knows what he is then? He might be nothing. And Charbonnet is just beginning his career. So, um, sorry, I don't, I, it's, I don't, it's tough. I don't have it in front of me. What was the duration of Mixon's contract with the uh, Texans? Did they give him three? Uh, well, they traded him. Uh, so it's whatever oh, was left right. over with that's Cincinnati. Right. So it was a trade, not a release. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think I have it on my sheet here. I can look at it. Uh, his contract with Houston now is only this year. So, oh, okay. Uh, okay. 6.1 against the cap. So. Let's quickly wrap on the running backs with Gus Edward to the Chargers. We can go quickly on Edwards, but I just bring it up because there is, you know, carries available here with Eckler God, and it's a team that, you know, now that they have Greg Roman, will want to run the ball a lot. Obviously, Gus Edwards has excelled in a Greg Roman offense before. Maybe <clears throat> more kind of like we've talked about some of these other aging running backs, a win now type of player to go after, but I think he's the type of player that could offer for like the eighth consecutive year, sneaky value, you know, just based on touchdown equity and the fact that the team runs so much. What do you think, Bob, and quickly on Edwards? I mean, you said it too. I mean, you know, uh, there's opportunity here. The Chargers don't have a lot of money. They have other holes to fill. So running back is going to be pretty low on that draft list. So, yeah, I think us Edwards for this year holds value. For the future, probably not so much. But we've said that about him, like you said, for eight years. <laughs> yeah. And he keeps holding a little value. So, I mean, an RB4 isn't bad. Fitz, what, what do you think? Is he going to be a good mentor to Blake Corum? Exactly, Boggs. You know Jim Harbaugh is going to draft Blake Corum. So, um, yeah, I mean, Edwards is going to share work. He turns 29 in April. Dynasty leagues are PPR leagues, and Edwards doesn't catch passes. I'm just not interested. He's like RB68 for me. <laughs> By now, most of you have probably heard of Reality Sports Online, the powerful fantasy sports platform where owners get to build and manage their fantasy team like an NFL general manager. But the question is, have you tried it? It's time to go see what all the buzz in the Dynasty community is about. Free agency, multi-year contracts, a rookie draft, multi-team trades, franchise tags, contract extensions, first-round rookie options, automated contract and salary cap functionality, and much, much more. I think it sounds complicated. It's not. The best thing about Reality Sports Sports Online Fantasy Front Office is that it doesn't take any more time than a standard league. It just requires more strategy. Think you're among the fantasy elite? Well, this is the platform to test your mettle. Still not sure? You can test out your general manager skills for free in a mock free agency auction. If you like what you see, use the promo code FANTASYPROS to receive a 10% discount on your team or league today. That's promo code FANTASYPROS to receive a 10% discount on your team or league today. Fantasy just got real at Reality Sports Online. Dot com. Guys, I know we went pretty long in the running backs. They were kind of the story of early free agency, so I think that was reasonable. We'll go a bit quicker on the other positions because there just hasn't been as much. Quarterbacks, the, the obviously big one is Kirk Cousins to the Falcons. This is something that we talked about in some of our preview shows, what it could mean. I think the general consensus was maybe a bit of a downgrade for Kirk but certainly an upgrade for the guys around him. Bogman, what's your biggest takeaway? Is it a downgrade for the Vikings guys? Is it the downgrade for Kirk? Is it the upgrade for the Atlanta guys? What's the biggest storyline from this transaction? I think it's the upgrade for the Atlanta guys. Um, you know, there are questions with Kirk, though. He's coming off this Achilles injury, so it's not like this is a clean move. So we're going to have to see what Kirk looks like in camp, um, what he's moving around like. Is this, uh, does this get re-aggravated or anything? Obviously, we hope not. They just dropped the Brinks truck on him. So um, we're assuming he's going to be okay and out there for week one and look fine. So if that is the case, which we all hope and assume, then yes, um, it's the Drake London moving up. Kyle Pitts moving up, maybe just more in the overall, probably not positionally because he's already so high. And for Minnesota, I mean, it sucks for Minnesota. Uh, you know, Sam Darnold is whatever. But um, I think for Atlanta, it's a nice boost for Kirk himself. I mean, I'm going to move him down one spot. I'm going to move him below Matt Stafford. Right. Because they're both 88 babies. Uh, they're both the same age. And. He's not coming off this injury. Stafford's not coming off an injury. And um, I would have had I had Kirk ahead, assuming he was going to land in Minnesota, because like we said, Kevin O'Connell loves to abandon the run. He loves to pass the ball, especially with Kirk. I think that changes with Kirk gone. Uh, so uh, I think this is a lateral move for the value of Kirk Cousins, but it boosts the guys around him. And we like that. Fitz, what do you think? 
Yeah, hard to put Cousins in the top 25 in Dynasty rankings because he's going to turn 36 and is coming off that Achilles injury, but... He's always been a better fantasy quarterback than real life quarterback, and I think he is capable of finally unlocking um, Drake London and Kyle Pitts, who you know not only are rid of Arthur Smith, but gain this quarterback who's proven to be a really good distributor. Maybe Cousins can even unlock a certain diminutive former Purdue wide receiver who we're going to talk <laughs> about later. Uh, yes, for sure. Right, just just quickly on the Vikings side of it, though. Are you guys downgrading Jefferson and Addison and Hawkinson? I know he's got the injury at all, like significantly with this. I, I mean, think those guys are QB proof. There's not a lot of okay. QB proof guys in the league, Worm. But, you know, Jefferson proved it last year. He was putting up big games with Dobbs and guys like that. So I think he's fine. And Addison made Kenny Pickett all that money, apparently. So, you know, I think these guys are somewhat QB proof. Yeah, I'm not. I want to not. Go, oh, sorry. I was just going to say I'm not downgrading them in terms of dynasty value. It sucks for them in the short term, but they've they're young guys with long career runways, so yeah. uh, I wouldn't, you know, significantly downgrade their value. I'm going to throw four backup e quarterbacks your guys' way. Pick one that is at all interesting, and, and maybe the answer is zero. Sam Darnold to the Vikings could be their starter, depending. Let's we'll see what they do the rest of the offseason. Russell Wilson to the Steelers could be their starter. Sorry, Bogman. Uh, Jameis Winston to Cleveland, where we just saw what a backup quarterback can do. Uh, you know, if Deshaun Watson continues to be ineffective or, uh, you know, not healthy. Uh, and then right before we started recording, Desmond Ritter to Arizona for uh, Greg Dortch, who was just, uh, you know, referenced by. By Pitts. We'll get to him in a second. But of the quarterbacks, Darnold, Russ, Jameis, and Ritter, anything here, Bogman? Yeah, uh, Darnold, you know, he keeps getting shots. And, you know, uh, can we say that he's had a fair shake? Uh, I, I think he probably has. Like, he's probably not the guy. But the Jets were miserable. Adam Gase. The Panthers, look at the Panthers. Look at all the mistakes that that franchise has made. They've been terrible. Uh, and then he didn't get a shot because Brock Purdy was busy leading the Niners to the Super Bowl. So I don't know that he's gotten a real fair shake, but I also would say that a guy that is super talented wouldn't be on his fourth team. So Sam Darnold is potentially getting another shot here, depending on what the Vikings do in the draft. Um but I, I think he's the only one that really holds interest. Sure, Wilson's going to start for a year, but he's washed. Ritter is trash. I mean, he's nothing to me. And then, um, you know, who, who's the last guy here? Oh, Winston. Winston in Cleveland is not bad, but I, I think Winston wants to be a backup. I don't think he really wants to play. So um, there were other opportunities he probably could have taken if he wanted to start. So I think he's fine holding the clipboard. I think it's probably the best place for him anyway. So um, maybe there's an opportunity for him to play. But out of this group, Darnold is the only really interesting one to me at all. Fitz, what do you think about this group of four? I don't want Ritter or Winston on my dynasty roster. Just no use for him. Um, Wilson, this at least preserves his value by giving him a, you know, a home for 2024. I've got him QB 30 for dynasty. I, I don't know if he's the same guy he was before, but at least he's got a job. Darnold is interesting like I don't know if he can be a league average starting quarterback but there have been interesting flashes I think it was what early in the 2021 season like those first four or five games with the Panthers he was actually good for a while I think he had like four rushing touchdowns in those first five games was decent as a passer then the wheels just kind of came off but then the following year is that when he had mono or was that in New York I can't remember the mono uh, thing. good question I, I, th I so want to say weird. the mono was in New York I think that was when he was too. with the Jets yeah then in 2022 when Baker Mayfield the one guy and like DJ Moore has played with a litany of mediocre quarterbacks throughout his career like DJ Moore had managed to produce with like Kyle Allen and all of a sudden couldn't get going with Baker Mayfield. He and Mayfield just couldn't get on the same page. The Panthers trade Mayfield to the Rams and Darnold comes in and actually gets DJ Moore jump started again. So like I'm I'm curious if Darnold has learned enough now with his time on the bench. Um, you know, we've seen that formula work for quarterbacks in Green Bay. A guy gets to sit and learn and all of a sudden they get a chance to play and they look really good. So maybe that happens with Arnold. I don't know. Uh, I forget if when I said this out loud, if I said Rydell Moore or Greg Dorch, but the guy that Ritter was traded for was Moore. 
Dorch, of course, is a guy in Arizona that a lot of people are excited about. So as we move to the receivers, I want to ask you about both those guys. Rondell Moore, a guy who, when he was in college, we were just talking about it before the show fits. When he was at Purdue, like there was some real legitimate excitement about him. Uh, has not panned out in Arizona. Dorch is a guy that people have loved to see when he's gotten opportunities. Kind of a favorite like fantasy sleeper in the industry. Uh, either of those guys interest you more now that this trade has gone down? Man, like I don't know. I mean, it seems like there's not any more opportunity for Rondale in Atlanta than he had in Arizona. Like Arizona, there was probably a better path to targets than there is now. I I don't want to give up on the guy because I loved him so much when he was at Purdue. I mean, when he was a freshman, he averaged like better than 100 yards from scrimmage a game, basically one touchdown per game, beat Ohio State more or less single-handedly when he was a freshman. Um, I, I, it just hasn't worked out for him, hasn't been able to stay healthy. Uh, it just seems like a, a very limited short area receiver. So I don't know. I, I can't say I have a lot of hope that this is going to rekindle Rondell Moore's dynasty value. <laughs> Bogman, this was such a dynasty trade, like a long time league, two guys, just distressed <laughs> yes. assets. Like, yeah, sure, I kind of need a quarterback. Maybe Ritter will have a shot. Oh, yeah, okay. Maybe Moore kind of figures it out. It feels like a dynasty league trade. That just happened in the real NFL. I mean, Rondo Moore would rank fifth of guys with his last name at wide receiver <laughs> in the NFL. And DJ Moore, Elijah Moore, Sky Moore. Uh, Wait, yeah, I mean, you're putting them behind Sky? Really? I'd put him behind Sky. I'd put him behind Chris Moore as well. So, <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, look, Rondo Moore is done. Uh, I maybe Atlanta unlocks something. I he just doesn't have the speed to separate, and he's small. He can't make contested catches, which makes him nothing in the NFL. Move to running back. Uh, so, um, I, I don't. I don't know what he's doing. Look, you know, the same. It's a whole different regime, but this is the same franchise that put Patterson at running back. So maybe they want to do that with Rondell Moore. I don't know. But um, uh, he ain't a wide receiver. I, I know that. Um, well, let's let's jump ahead to – we'll skip some of the bigger wide receiver uh, names for the time being and go to Darnell Mooney, who also is going to Atlanta. Uh, seems like a really good fit in terms of can maybe get some defensive interest but not take too many targets away from like Drake London or Kyle Pitts. So kind of a perfect fit, I think, as a complementary piece in terms of what dynasty managers are looking for out of their stars. Right, Bogman? Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, I think this is a good landing spot for him. Uh, I mean, how many, uh, you know, of those compilations did we see of, uh, you know, him wide open and then just be overthrown by whoever fields or whoever was quarterbacking uh, in Chicago. So I do think there's an opportunity for Mooney here in Atlanta to be something. I'm still going to have him like in the 60s, probably among the wide receiver is deep and we have a big class coming in too so uh in terms of value it's not high but in terms of upside there is a lot with mooney there is nothing with rondo moore in my opinion so it's mooney is down at wide receiver 78 in dynasty any interest in bumping him up or i've got him 65 Mooney is an underrated wide receiver, and I like this signing a lot for Atlanta. I think it's going to help them, but it is hard to see um, targets being anything but sparse for Mooney with, uh, you know, London, Pitts. Um, it, it just it seems like Mooney is going to have a boom bust profile because he's not going to be targeted heavily. There are going to be some splash plays in big games, but it's going to be really hard to predict him. I'd rather have him in best ball dynasty than in managed league dynasty where you have to set a lineup every week let's get to the biggest wide receiver move uh calvin ridley again a surprise it seemed like the jags it seemed like maybe the patriots were in on them he goes to the titans four years 92 million very big deal um bogman fitz and i have talked a bit about ridley on a you know quick recap microcast yesterday from day three of free agency so i want to start with you and get your opinion on this deal I think this is uh, good for Tennessee. I don't know if it's good for Ridley. It's fine for Ridley. I also find it funny that, you know, all the memes we've seen is, hey, look, the Titans were plus 1,800 to get a, a Calvin Ridley, and he winds up there. That's strange. <laughs> uh, but uh, th there's that, and then there's also, you know, uh, just the, the, the fact that I think he can come in here and be a number one and be the number one for um, Will Levis. So they also didn't they trade AJ Brown because he wanted 100 mil for four <laughs> years. They gave Calvin Ridley 96. I mean, I think you might have messed up there, Tennessee, which is why Mike Vrabel is gone now. But um, look, just the landing spot is fine for Calvin Ridley. Um, I think it's 
fairly lateral because Trevor Lawrence and Jacksonville did not look good last year. So um, I think it's a good spot for him to potentially be a number one, uh, but it's not super exciting. It's fine. It's very lateral to me. What what do you make, Bogman, quickly of Levis right now at Dynasty? Mm-hmm. Because he had occasional flashes. He was a guy that was pretty divisive during the draft process. He now is throwing to DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley. He now has both Spears and Tony Pollard in the backfield. The skill and, and they are going to draft an offensive lineman in the top ten. You have to believe. Yes. Like there are a lot of pieces in place for him to take a step forward if he has it in him to do so. Yeah, I mean, look, you know. It's going to be how quickly he picks up this offense, right? Uh, and that that is the big thing with him is we know he has everything that's unteachable. He can run. He has a gigantic arm. Um, so it's about the processing. It's about being able to fit. And it's about being able to make throws in the pocket uh, and not bail out real fast. So uh, there's a lot going into his development. But if you are going to develop a guy like Will Levis, you have to surround him with talent. And I think the Titans are moving towards that. So I think it's a smart idea. I think adding a guy like Ridley helps the overall offense and it helps your quarterback, too. So I like this move for him a lot. Fitz, we already reacted to this on yesterday's microcast. But from a dynasty perspective, quickly, what are your thoughts? I like it for Levis, but I don't see any silver lining for Ridley's value with this signing. He goes to a team that already has a very well-established, accomplished wide receiver and one that has an unproven quarterback. I mean, we saw Will Levis light it up in his debut last year, four touchdowns, and the rest of the season was like the Chris Farley meme where he's like really excited (laughs) and then it just turns to like... JoJo the idiot circus boy. Disappointment. (laughs) So, um, yeah, like I just, I, I don't see how this really helps Calvin Ridley's value. He's 29. Uh, What he gave us last year wasn't a bad performance, but it was definitely below superstar level. So I'm I'm just, I'm not excited about this. Let's go to the guy that is now in Jacksonville replacing Calvin Ridley, and that's Gabe Davis. This is another guy who, Bogman, we talked about last week. Uh, If he couldn't figure it out with Josh Allen, how is he going to figure it out somewhere else? He's now attempting to with a guy who has all the talent in the world in Trevor Lawrence, but hasn't quite taken that next leap yet. What do you make of Davis's dynasty value in Jacksonville? It's not good. You know, I think exactly what you said is if you can't figure it out with Josh Allen, how are you going to figure it out anywhere else, right? So, um, I mean, maybe Trevor Lawrence has more touch on those downfield throws, but he has not looked good. Uh, He's not lived up to his hype, I guess I should say. It's not that he hasn't been good. He just definitely has not been the next chosen one that we all thought he was going to be uh, when he came out of Clemson. So, um, not a good spot. Your fourth in the pecking order in terms, maybe fifth in pecking order in terms of receptions but behind Zay Jones, Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram, and probably Travis Etienne as well. So I do not like this spot for him at all. Fitz, I was surprised to see that Gabe Davis is still only 24. He'll be 25 in a couple of weeks, so he'll be 25 by the time the season starts, obviously, but still just 24 years old. Uh, I mean, he, he there's time, right? There, He could maybe figure it out if if Lawrence kind of also takes the leap and, and he gets used more. I mean, it's kind of hard to get used more than being the number two receiver in that Bills offense. But I guess I'm just trying to kind of grasping at straws here for some optimism. Well, think back to that playoff game against the Chiefs. Like a oh, guy yeah. who stinks could not have that sort of a game. So it, it's not a bad landing spot. I probably like Trevor Lawrence and have more optimism for him than Bogman does. Um, but... I guess the issue with Gabe Davis has been his ability to earn targets. And I don't know if he all of a sudden becomes a prominent target earner in Jacksonville. Um, So like Darnell Mooney, he is a guy I'd rather have in a best ball dynasty league than in a managed league where you have to decide whether to start him every week. That performance in the playoffs against Kansas City, that was such a prime example of like signature significance. Like if a guy does that, there has to be some level of competency or, or greatness in him because that doesn't just fluke into a performance right. like that. He was he was dominant. Um, the other big name wide receiver changing teams, Deontay Johnson traded to the Carolina Panthers for a cornerback and a late round pick swap. This is another one that Fitz and I talked about a little bit in the microcast yesterday. So Bogman, I'll start with you again. I mean, a guy who got all the targets he could possibly ask for in Pittsburgh with poor quarterback play kind of looks like he's going into that same spot, but maybe actually coming from one of the places where Carolina is a quarterback upgrade, possibly if you bake in some improvement in year two for Bryce Young. 
Yeah, you'd think so, right? Like, uh, you know, improve this offensive line so you can keep y- your guy upright, right? Um, th- that is the big thing for the Carolina Panthers here, and they added two guards. So uh, specifically on the interior was the issue last year. So I think it's very, very it, – those were better moves uh, for Bryce Young than adding a bunch of targets here for him because if the kid doesn't have one Mississippi to throw the football, it doesn't really matter how good the targets are. So they addressed that first, and then they traded for Deontay. So, um, look, good riddance to Deontay. I don't like him at all. I think he's a terrible teammate, and I'm glad he's gone. But in terms of really fantasy, uh, I think he's awful. <laughs> I punched Mitch Trubisky in the face. That's why Kenny Pickett came and came in and started the game, the first game that he did, is because Deontay punched him in the face. So uh, he's not a good teammate. He got in a fight with Mika Fitzpatrick in the locker room last year, too. So he is definitely uh, locker room cancer, but he's talent. He's very, very talented, and I think they were lacking any type of speed. A guy that can snap off a route, play over the middle. Um, they didn't have a tight end last year that was very good uh, for Carolina. So you add someone that can actually catch the ball with a little bit of juice, too. I think you help the overall offense. So I think this is a good move for Deontay. Like you mentioned, uh, Worm probably improved quarterback play, even from a young guy in Bryce Young who looked bad last year. So I think it's a positive move overall for Deontay, even though I do not like him as a person. Bogman, give me 30 seconds on Mike Williams getting released. Who cares? He's dusted. <laughs> Done. Okay. Uh, Wait, can, tight- I, can, I hear, <laughs> can I hear Bogman's take on what the Deontay Johnson trade does for Pickens' value? Um, I, I think that for, you know, Arthur Smith is a one wide receiver type of guy. If, if you uh, noticed that last year, from, he's a one wide receiver and a John U. Smith uh, type of guy. But, uh, you know, Drake London was the only one really getting a consistent target. So I think it's good for Pickens, but they do need to add somebody else because uh, now this, you know, with Ka- Calvin Austin is the two now. So, uh, well, actually, Tyler Boyd, they signed today. So Tyler Boyd is the two now. But I still think you need a little more juice and speed. Uh, someone over the middle. So uh, I think they're probably going to add someone in the draft, and they're usually pretty successful at uh, adding wide receivers in the draft. Not the most exciting tight end class, but just to name three moves here. Mike Isicki to Cincinnati, Noah Fant staying with the Seahawks, new offensive coordinator there now, obviously, and Hayden Hurst, while we were recording this, goes to the Chargers. Any of those three, again, Kasicki to the Bengals, Fant staying with the Seahawks, Hurst to the Chargers. Uh, you know, Fitz, I'll start with you here. Any of those three stand out to you or, or not really interested in any of them? I was hoping for a change of scenery for Fant to see if another team could potentially leverage all that athleticism uh no interest whatsoever in Hurst Gesicki I'm a little confused about I don't know if this is just um another Irv Smith situation where all of a sudden we get interest in him because he's going to be in this good offense and then it's this ad hoc tight end situation with Tanner Hudson and Drew Sample and Gesicki all sharing targets so um I I did move Gesicki up some but I feel like it could be a trap Bob, I mean, what do you think about any of those three? Uh, I, Noah Fant, I think, is uh, a possible guy to to get a little more in a new system. Uh, it's Ryan Grubb coming in, so we'll see what he has. I assume they're going to run the ball a lot with McDonald as the head coach there. You know, run the ball, play defense, I think is going to be the name of the game with Walker and Charbonnet. Uh, but there's too many targets. So uh, Gesicki in Cincinnati, he'll probably have a couple big games. But uh, he'll be very hit or miss. So not a lot of excitement from the tight ends. Yeah, I agree. Also, not really interested in Hurst. But, you know, back for United with Greg Roman for whatever that's worth. I think probably not a lot. Uh, That was jam-packed. We got through a ton of players there. Obviously, very heavily weighted towards the running backs like we alluded to. But that was the way this free agency went. So I appreciate everybody sticking around to the end of the show. For Bogman and for Fitz, I am Ryan Wormley. We'll see you again next week. (laughs) 